Hi there, I just wanted to preface this video by saying that we had um, pretty bad communications. Um, the the Wi-Fi there where Daryl is, which is in the middle of the bush somewhere in the in Zambia on the Kafui River, is uh, is very slow and not great. So the connection wasn't very good. And actually halfway through the interview, we, we lost comms completely. So it's a short one. Uh, but Hannes is in constant contact with Daryl. And, um, and he will be producing a lot more great content with Daryl because Daryl has a lot of stories to tell. The guy was in, in, in constant combat for about 12 years and it's a mystery to me how he wasn't showered with the top medals that, that the land had to offer. Uh, but those of us who were in the Rhodesian army all regard him as an absolute legend. And um, in this video, he reminds me a little bit of uh, Colonel Kurtz in the movie Apocalypse Now, which you'll see. <laughs> uh, but that just kind of adds to his mystique. I have a little bit of um, uh, history with Daryl in that when I was a young uh, recruit in Intake 140, uh, at Llewellyn Barracks, I decided to, to, to sign up and join the SAS and they said, but before you can, before you can join, uh, before you can go on selection, you have to do an 18 week or four and a half month RLI recruit course, and then you can come on SAS selection. So myself, Graham Peake and Matt Lamb, uh, all, uh, passed our RLI recruit course, were badged in RLI, crossed the fence and, and went and did our SAS selection. Uh, Graham Peak and myself passed, Matt Lamb failed, but l went back for a second try and um, passed the second time round and was badged SAS as was Graham Peak. Uh, I completed my SAS recruit course, but uh, I RTU'd myself just before para course uh, because I wanted to go back to the RLI and, join, and do fire force operations. Uh, so I was never badged SAS. In hindsight, that was a really stupid decision. I should have stayed in the SAS, done my para course, been badged SAS, and then if I wanted to RTU you myself. But, you know, when you're young and stupid uh, and, uh, you know, you can't change history. And on SAS recruit course, uh, our, our trainers were uh, Corporal Skippers and, uh, and Sergeant Daryl Watt. I think head of training troop then was uh, Ian, Captain Ian McLean. Uh, so yeah, I, I do have some experience uh, of Daryl Watt, and uh, it's a real privilege to to hear his story and uh, and um, connect with him in this way. So I hope you guys enjoy uh, the video that's coming up. Thanks very much. Okay, I am continuing our series, which I started with Rich Stannard on um, the, the fighting men of Rhodesia. I'm happy to say I've managed to track down probably the greatest of them all, in my humble opinion, um, Daryl Watt, who uh, is out in the 
wilds of Western Zambia on the Kafiri River where he's doing what he does best, which is protecting wildlife. But um, Daryl uh, is the chap that I did the my, my first book on the Rhodesian War with, uh, titled A Handful of Hard Men. And um, I managed to, I like to think I managed to capture some of his story there. But for a man who was at the coalface of a very bitter conflict for 12 years, uh, and he was in a combat situation almost continually, it's, uh, it's hard to capture that whole story. So um, we've picked up on a few operations that I missed out on and a handful of hard men and included them in the, in the new book that, uh, that I've done with Rich Stannard and Men of War. Um, but his story is an ongoing one. Uh, and um, he's continuing the good fight in a different arena, protecting wildlife now. But um, Daryl, uh, just great to have you uh, here on camera. And um, I'm sorry you couldn't find a shirt to wear for the occasion, but I understand it's hot in uh, hot in Central Africa in uh, late October. So. Um, will excuse your, your, your lack of attire. But um, Daryl, just, uh, I don't know where to start with you really. There's, there's so much to talk about, but a little bit about the, uh, the beginning, how you ended up in the SAS, right? All right, thank you, Ernest. I left school at 17 years old and I got into the wildlife business. It was not for long, one year in the year 66, until 77, when I got called up by the Rhodesian Army as a territorial soldier. They said you have to be the best unit there was, and that's how I joined the SAS. And I continued to stay there until the end of 1980. Daryl, okay, you're breaking up a bit. And uh, Daryl, your first your first operations, your first contact. Okay, it was not long after doing my recruit course, if I remember it was the end of 1967 and certainly 1968, where I was 18 years old and right in the front line of everything. Daryl, can you go, just go into a bit more detail about that? What actually happened? What was the background to, that, to those engagements? Uh, because I had this uh, extended bush truck and tracking ability, I was used immediately for what I, I knew. So it started off with a follow-up, following a couple of guys and actually catching them and holding them as a prisoner. And um, Daryl, your first operations outside the country, externals. Oh, goodness. Um, they all started off pretty small. No fighting, but mainly doing recce, getting information, finding the camps, marking them out, seeing what's happening there. Did a lot of those in the beginning. And then, Daryl, uh, tell us a bit about your ability as a tracker, uh, your, your successes. Um, I know you did a very long follow starting somewhere in Mozambique. Um, do you want to just talk us through a bit about tracking to combat and... Um, some of the follow-ups you did. Yeah, sure. All right, because I had this ability to do it um, from a young age, before I joined Alan Savory, I was brought up doing things like that. Bushcraft, tracking. So it was quite simple. In fact, humans are easier to track than animals. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I won't go into it now, but besides that, I learned a lot on bushcraft. And my ears and eyes were open all the time. I was in the front and I could hear and do things long before it actually happened. What was the longest follow-up you did? From inside Mozambique coming into Rhodesia, it was a good 30 kilometers. How many days? It took about two days and a bit. So we were right on top of them, expecting them any moment. And um, 
the RAR intercepted the tracks just ahead of us because they were following our good references. So they picked up the tracks and not long after them picking them up, they made contact. We didn't. Daryl, uh, just a little bit about bushcraft, what the techniques you used for survival, uh, relying on birds and other, other, other forms of wildlife to assist you in uh, knowing what's going on around you. All right. As you know, bushcraft is related to tracking. Unless you don't know a lot of either of that, and I mean a lot, nothing really works. But to talk about bushcraft, it's just a matter of knowing every single bird, knowing every animal spore, every animal, including, including the primates, crickets, you name it, just about everything. Everything had an alarm call. And everything would tell you there's something in front of you. It's like sitting in the garden here where I am now. And a chicken makes a noise, whether it's a cock or a hen. And I've got to know now all the, 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 the kind of sounds chickens and make. And they make a certain sound, and I'll know there's a raptor. And we all start looking where the raptor is. Or another example, a mother hen with five new chicks. She speaks a language to those chicks. And for example, the food chain part of it, she will give a certain sound saying, come, there's some food here. And then again, if there's something that's suspicious that she doesn't want the chicks to eat, she will go there and take this thing and give another. But anyway, that's just an example from the domestic side and also more so the, the bush in the wild. Daryl, um, looking back, um, which of you, you were on countless operations uh, with different objectives, but um, what part of your soldiering did you, did you most enjoy? So the answer is that chicken giving some kind of alarm, alarm sound there, so I probably... <laughs> Uh, Daryl, did you hear me? Again, please. Now, looking back on on that period, um, where were you happiest? I know you enjoyed your time with Renamo in Mozambique. Um, was that a, a particular? Was that a highlight in your in your military uh, in your time in the Rhodesian Army? I would say it was the safest with all those guys around us working together. We just felt at home. We didn't feel threatened every hour of our life when we were external. Where else, you know, when we were alone, we had to keep our ears and eyes peeled all the time. And I mean, day or night. Whether you're in a deep sleep or not, we learned to um, use our ears and we could sleep. One of them would pick up something like let's say for example all the crickets making a noise and all of a sudden they go quiet okay without a doubt it means there's someone there then we immediately all wake up and get ourselves ready in case we had to get out of there fast and it worked every time especially if it was a human because it was a different noise the crickets stopped making it for long and you could actually hear the crickets in that area where they're walking in the dark of the night, and you'd soon know exactly which direction they're coming from. And that would tell us which way to go, to leave that place. Even if it was just two men coming in and checking on, trying to locate our position, which they normally did, they wouldn't all come together unless they knew exactly where we were. So this was the um, advanced party to come and find us, to hear a cough or snoring or something if we had slack truth. So that was a sure sound that we knew and we just get ready to get out of the firing line. Daryl, where did you feel the most vulnerable, the most exposed? What what areas? No go areas. Within Rhodesia. Oh, sorry, I missed that? No go areas or liberated areas within Rhodesia. Just tell us a, a bit about that. What was going on there? Well, because 
because no security forces in there, they felt very bold, they controlled the whole area and the civilians there and had sentries everywhere. So, you know, we had to be so damn careful when we moved there, although they never detected me and my group. We managed to get in there and right on top of them without them knowing we were there until the next morning. And so what was your, what was your tactical appreciation in those areas? Were you defensive or did you go on the attack? Both. Do, do you want to uh, just expand on that a bit? Uh, I know you, you're probably down in the low felt. Uh, when I say both, Daryl, then I seem to have lost you. 